My name is Carol. I'm from OnMicro, and I'm here with Chris from Tinstorrent. Uh, and today we'll talk uh, about a uh, library we developed uh, for easing uh, development of PCIe-based devices uh, and for testing the software that runs on those PCIe, test, uh, PCIe devices. So uh, why do we even care about that? So if you look at what, what's happening nowadays, uh, more and more companies uh, develop their own offloading accelerators. Yeah? You cannot really calculate all the uh, stuff and, and process all the data that we want to process nowadays uh, on our uh, general purpose CPUs. So we have to offload the, uh, some of those tasks to, to some additional dedicated, so, uh, additional dedicated hardware. And since you know, the amount of data that we need to uh, process is huge, we need uh, like pretty fast interconnects and pretty fast uh, interfaces for those uh, accelerators. So PCIe is an obvious choice. It's like well-known, commonly supported uh, across many platforms and so on and so on. A great example of such accelerator is uh, what actually Meta showed uh, last uh, EOSS, uh, last Zephyr Development Summit uh, in Prague uh, in the keynote. Uh, they develop uh, a custom silicon for, uh, for Codex and AI accelerator. Uh, there is also, you know, the second example is what the Instruments right now, uh, right now does. Uh, there's uh, again a, a PCIe-based uh, chip uh, that that uh, can be used as a generator. Uh, so uh, this is obviously something that uh, that you know we will have more and more of those. Uh, so if you know. Um, if you don't, you hear about it in a moment. Uh, all those pieces of the of the system, they do run software. I mean, you have a software on the host side, that's obvious, but you have a bunch of software running on the devices. So the devices are not purely in silicon, they have CPUs, they have uh, a bunch of software of firmware uh, or firmware that is running there. And of course, you don't do a waterfall development because we don't have time for that. We, you know, the hardware team is working on the silicon, while the software team at the same time is working on the software. And since there's no silicon, you need to have a, some kind of a, a possibility of, of uh, running the software uh, before the silicon is ready, so you need some kind of an emulation. And it would be perfect if the emulation can actually uh, like simulate the exact PCA infrastructure and the exact PCA communication. Testing, of course, right? We want to test everything continuously. So. Yeah, exactly. So uh, even when the silicon is ready, you need to have a simulation uh, for that. So um, uh, how uh, how we can do that? Yeah. So uh, basically. Uh, Testing on such systems is pretty complex because you need to have a, like a, a host part, you need to have a, a device part, and they do have to communicate. So uh, you need to run, uh, while the host part can somehow be run natively, the, the device part will pretty always be a different architecture or a smaller CPU, a smaller SOC, so you have to somehow simulate that, that, that you know, embedded system actually that is, that is there on the device. Uh, and of course, uh, you need to somehow communicate them, you need to somehow create this virtual bus connection, exchange the data back and forth, and the more you can test, the more you can cover, the better, because you will just avoid problems in future. Um, so how can you run the simulation? So the obvious choice for, especially if you are a ASIC developer, like RTL developer, is just to run simulation of the whole system, like a RTL simulation. It's pretty accurate, it's like clock cycle accurate. Uh, but, and, and it will tell you everything. Like if something works there, there is a big chance that it will uh, work on the hardware. Uh, of course, uh, if, if the rest of the like, physics is, is okay, because uh, it will simulate the digital part of, of the whole system. Uh, but unfortunately, it is slow. I mean, it's cycle it, accurate, right? Yeah, yeah so. I mean, it comes at a price. It's super accurate, but, uh, and you know, clock cycle accurate but you have to take into consideration every single event that is happening in a digital system, very complex digital system, uh, to do that. There are you know, things like uh, uh, simulators like Verilator, which is a fast one, but still, considering the, uh, the complexity of the system, uh, it will take time to, to run a simulation that and boot software and actually test it. And software developers are lazy or like, uh, 
uh, maybe not lazy, they require immediate uh, response or immediate answer. You run make and you need, like, if the, if the result is not there after 10 seconds, you just go for a coffee and you forget what you did. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we need it fast. Uh, so, we can, we can switch to something like a, uh, something that is called cost simulation, where part of the system is actually uh, simulated still at the uh, clock uh, cycle level accuracy, but the rest of the system, majority of the system, is typically simulated at the instruction level. Yeah? So, for example, you simulate a CPU and a bunch of uh, peripherals uh, at the instruction uh, level where you don't care about the exact timings, the exact uh, uh, like physics of the, of the system, but you do provide the information that software needs uh, for that. Yeah, so I mean, I guess the big difference is, you know, functionally accurate versus clock cycle accurate. So if when you're bringing up brand new hardware, you want that cycle accuracy, but for the faster stuff that you're already confident, you have confidence in, like the host system, the functional accuracy is fine. Mm -hmm. How many people in the audience have uh, done like hardware emulation of, of new systems? Anybody? Okay. So let me ask you a simple question. Like what's, let's, let's consider three scenarios. What's faster? Um, you know, or what's faster and, le and what's least painful, I suppose is a good question. So uh, hardware emulation, you know, sitting down there with your emulator in the system and, you know, reloading that image in the bitstream all, all, over and over again versus writing a model, a machine model in Kimu versus composing your hardware dynamically and then using an emulated bus. Anyone want to guess? Anyone? Option C? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that one uh, will just give you something that you can work with uh, way faster. And in the end, since you know the uh, the half of the system, like bigger part of the system, actually will be uh, just uh, like uh, uh, instruction level, not really cycle accurate. It should work faster. However, still, if you want to simulate PCIe. Uh, the whole serialization, deserialization part, you know, clocking can be pretty complex, so the RTL level uh, simulation will still slow down the whole experience. It will be faster than, than just pure RTL, but still not what we want when we develop software, because we, we want answers immediately. Uh, so why not switch to completely to instruction set uh, simulator uh, and just have everything as fast as possible? Of course it's doable, and there are some models of uh, PCIe devices that, that you can use. Uh, the biggest problem with that, that they are not really, uh, they are not really modeling the, the real underlying uh, hardware. Uh, because they, they typically default to uh, things like uh, you do the initialization and then you uh, leverage the fact that PCIe devices are simply memory mapped. Uh, so every single transaction to these PCIe devices is uh, in those ISS simulators uh, is immediate. You don't have any, like, uh, any NDA. You don't have any possibility of uh, uh, injecting any errors or modifying the transaction or even uh, figuring out what would happen if I have to wait for my transaction. Uh, so, you know, you, you may not catch any problems like, uh, you know, there is a physics underneath and, you know, everything works fine unless I have, uh, I have to wait for the data. Uh, so that's not something that we want to use. Uh, of course, it is used widely, but uh, we still would like to have, uh, like, a better representation of the hardware. Uh, but without uh, without the overhead of, of simulating that on the like s clock accurate or cycle accurate level, so here comes Warpipe, a library we've been worked on. We've been working on. Uh, so Warpipe is a collaboration between Antmicro and Meta. Uh, we did that together to actually build a. Uh, piece of software that uh, allows you to, to construct like a bigger complex systems uh, where you can uh, still be in the instruction set simulator uh, speed grade, uh, but model the underlying hardware infrastructure and somehow uh, model the, the fact that uh, PCA transactions is, uh, are like by nature uh, packetized and there is a stream of data, not immediate data uh, appearance on the other side. It's fully open source, uh, licensed on Apache license, written in C. Uh, you can just go to this link and, and, and grab it, run the tests, integrate with the system. Uh, 
and and to do whatever you want with it. Uh, so so uh, it's there. Um, uh, the idea behind it is that it's always agnostic. We don't really. Uh, it's not implemented in a way that you have to, you know, use it with Linux, Zephyr, or whatsoever. However, there are some uh, helpful features that I will be talking about uh, in a few slides uh, that, that uh, you know, they are ready to use with Linux and Zephyr. So, so that's uh, that's that. And of course, we're capitalizing on the fact that PCI Express is a network architecture. It's not. It's no longer like a simple bus. We have a network, and there are components in the network, and it's packetized. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at the uh, schematic, uh, I think you want to talk about that? For sure. Uh, this is kind of the key feature, I would say. Um, uh, so we, what we have is we have the physical layer, we have you know, uh, data link layer, and so on and so forth. Warpipe just sits in the middle. We're, we're basically emulating um, things at, uh, from, from the, um, the, almost, the, almost the application layer uh, all the way down. Uh, and what we're doing is a DLLP uh, representation and TLP representation. So that's data link layer and transaction layer. Mm -hmm. um, the, oh, sure yeah. And uh, the library, of course, comes with a bunch of uh, like helpful functions that allow you to, to uh, like integrate that kind of a system. And in, in its core, uh, it's uh, at the very bottom, as you can see, this, there is this nice pipe there. Uh, at, at its very core, it actually uh, handles the transactions there. So in Unix, we use uh, in Linux basically we use, use Unix sockets uh, to transfer the data uh, back and forth. So what you get from the libraries, beside of course the uh, the core functionality of handling the, the communication and connecting uh, two different pieces of the uh, of the simulation, uh, you get the whole logic for uh, that helps you. Uh, helps implementing the the whole stack of the PCIe uh, flow. So basically, you know, logic for packetizing, the packetizing, uh, uh, the, the transactions. Uh, so it's super easy uh, later to implement a model of a PCIe controller in your uh, in your hardware. Uh, things like you know some helpers that allow you to simply describe a, US, uh, a PCIe device with a YAML file, like human readable format, and then it would cross con uh, convert that immediate, like on the fly to uh, this, this uh, descriptor, like PCIe de device descriptor that then can be read from, uh, from, from a host. Uh, and of course, yeah. uh, that's incredibly important because whenever you're simulating an end-to-end -end system, uh, the, the host side has to know what to expect on the device side, and the device side has to know what to report to the host side. Mm -hmm. so, yep. yeah. uh, plus, you know, this type of description allows you to generate that on the fly. Like, you can, uh, you don't have to upfront uh, write your device, write your model. You can generate it, like from, for example, RTL description or, or RDL description. Or. And it's a single source of truth, which is important if you have continuous integration systems. So. Yeah, that's, that's that. Uh, so, if, when we are talking about packetization and depacketization, uh, Chris already mentioned that, uh, but there are a few layers in PCIe that actually, uh, a few different types of packets that, that can uh, be sent across the, across the system. So we do support two, two types of layers, two lowest, uh, type of, uh, two lowest layers in the, in the PCIe stack. So this is a data link layer packets, DLPs, and uh, transaction layer packets, TLPs, uh, that we can actually send back and forth between the simulated devices. So uh, we have the whole logic for like provided the data, uh, we do packetization, we send it over a uh, standard Unix socket, uh, receive on the other side, depacketize it, and just handle the data, like provide it to a uh, logic of the simulated device so that it can implement the rest there. And I, I see a couple of people in the audience that I know have dealt with PCI Express, so of course, Everyone here is aware that there is the physical layer as well. So one thing I could say is, like, well, how do you handle the, the physical layer, the handshaking, that sort of thing? Like, how do you know if you're connected to a CXL system or, or a classic PCIe, whatever, Gen 4 or something mm -hmm. like that? So do we have structure, uh, Carol, in Warpipe to kind of integrate that sort of out of band information. Yeah, yeah, but there is a, there is additional there are additional uh, functionality that you that where you can actually add your custom uh, communication or custom uh, signaling for for all of those. So uh, it is super extensible. You can uh, you can do that. It's, it's 
uh, thought of from the very beginning when we started uh, implementing the, uh, the uh, library. And when we are talking about the packetization, it's uh, kind of obvious that we would like to see them. Uh, you know, when, when you send the packets back and forth, uh, you'd like to observe what's happening there. Uh, so, uh, and the obvious choice for that is Wireshark. Wireshark is commonly used for you know, observing bunch of packets everywhere, like uh, Ethernet and, and so on and so on. Uh, so we did implement, uh, like with the, uh, with the library, we do provide uh, a custom dissector for Wireshark. So basically you could just grab it, uh, install, like by just copying it to a proper directory in Wireshark, in your local Wireshark installation, and uh, connect to, uh, to this uh, socket that we use for uh, communication between the, uh, between the simulated device and simply observe the, uh, the PCIe packets there. Uh, so basically it will strip whatever uh, custom headers we, we're adding to the, uh, to the standard packets that, that we send to, through, through the socket and display, more or less as you can see in this uh, slide, there is a, I think DLP, yeah, DL, uh, t sorry, TLP packet uh, uh, showed here and you can simply you know, analyze whatever is being sent by the uh, by the, by the uh, controller, uh, PCA controller in the simulated system. Super useful for debugging compl more complex system and uh, you know, checking what, what's happening there. What I find fantastic about this is that it basically enables any end user, anyone with an FPGA or not even if they just want to use a key system and uh, another host device or like a host system, uh, you can actually develop most of your PCI accelerator firmware and inspect the actual PCI packets that you expect to see. Anybody can do this, and it's like open source, so there's zero cost. It's amazing. Yep. Um, so the library comes with a few, uh, actually with many examples. I, I just listed a few of them here, but th there is more uh, in, in the repository. Uh, but those are like kind of representative of, of uh, what you can find there. So you can simply grab the, uh, the repo, build those. Uh, there is a readme, there is a, you know, uh, uh, there is a pretty nice documentation of that. Uh, so one like base one is PCA pipe that connects two Zephyr instances. One is working as a, a PCA host and the second one is working as a PCA device. Uh, and that one just uh, ex exchanges the information between them. So basically one uh, node like host is reading uh, a piece of memory from a uh, simulated uh, PCA device. And then we have some uh, simulated uh, message signal that interrupts uh, sent back and forth. Uh, I mean, from the uh, simulated uh, PCA device to a uh, simulated host. Uh, the second one is PCA native, uh, native which uh, uses uh, like a native application. So you don't have, if, if you want to focus mostly on the uh, on the device side, you don't really have to simulate or like emulate uh, or doing something special for the host side. You can simply use a user space Linux application for that and uh, connect to the, to the simulation of the device and focus on the firmware all running on the device. And of course, one of the core uh, functionality of PCIe is, is DMA. So most of the devices uh, work in a way that uh, a device is actually issuing a DMA transaction to the host mem to and from host memory. Uh, and we do have support for that. Uh, there is an example of that uh, where, uh, where you can configure uh, a, an emulated DMA device running on the uh, emulated PCIe device that actually starts the whole transaction and starts the, the whole data transfer between host, uh, host memory. Even, uh, either it's a native host like a user space application or simulated host in yet another uh, simulator. So that's that's actually like a typical flow of, of the of the PCA device. And then of course, uh, as we know in Zephyr, the beauty of device tree, because everyone loves device tree, is that you can swap out nodes. Uh, so whether or not we're using the emulated hardware in a Kimu uh, mm -hmm. target versus what, what we have in, in Zephyr is DMA emule, which is like software emulated. Um, I actually have a pull request in draft at the moment. I should really get that up. but. Um, we have a, a DMA emule backend now that should be able to hook right into uh, warp pipe, so yep. we'll get that up soon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That allows you to swap out the, the hardware sort of thing for a more software, which is a bit faster. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, we mentioned Zephyr a few times. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, warp pipe itself by design is not really 
dependent on any any type of uh, OS, or, OS or, or whatever you run it uh, with, or runtime or whatever you use underneath. Uh, however, it comes with a few fancy features that uh, make it way easier to integrate with a Zephyr-based system. So either if you uh, if you develop uh, Zephyr firmware for the device or Zephyr firmware or for the host, uh, it's super useful to to actually uh, work with that. Um, do you want to grab that one? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, one of the key features that I asked for was actually Twister integration, because as everyone knows, uh, Zephyr's upstream testing is done with Twister, and actually even at Tungstrom, we're using uh, Twister to do our continuous integration at the moment. Uh, it's pretty great. Um, it allows you to test multiple permutations of things all at once. Uh, but it also supports multiple um, implementations of a thing, multiple architectures, multiple configurations. So you can swap out one emulated device for a physical device and so on and so forth. So you can have actually the same test suite um, specifying your host software side of the test and your device side, uh, Z test, and you can run the device in emulation or you can run the device on physical hardware with um, memory math, or sorry, with, with a hard, um, what do they call it, the, the, the hardware math? I forget what it's called in Twister, one of those options. Mm -hmm. um, so in any case, uh, what AntMicro is really great about doing was make sure that we could integrate this with Twister and so that we could just hit the ground running with our continuous integration. Yep. Yeah, and that of course required some work. Uh, it didn't work out of the box because you know it should have, but uh, you know then you run it and then you find limitations. Uh, one of the limitations of, of Twister is right now that it assumes that it runs a single process underneath uh, because it is designed to basically build uh, a number of configurations and iterate over the configuration or, or you know select uh, a random configurations that we would, would test, but in the end it's always a single. Uh, binary to be run, and here since we uh, some of our configurations are like we have we need a simulated uh, host and simulated devices, uh, we need to run a few processes. Uh, so that one wasn't really supported, and of course, it's not a big issue to run a few processes. It's a bigger issue to actually control them in the end and and to be able to actually observe if they talk to each other correctly and kill them in the end. Or you know what starts up first? There's a bit of a race there, but we have to be able to support that potential use case. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, and uh, not to try to connect uh, a client to a server if the server is not up, or still initializing and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, uh, we had to extend uh, Twister to, to actually handle that. The, the code is open. It's uh, in, our, in our fork. It's to be uh, upstreamed in the following weeks, I suppose. Um, but the code is there. So if you want to use this feature, uh, you, can, you can always defer to uh, to the forked version uh, or the, the version that is provided with uh, the test suite of the uh, PCIe uh, wall pipe. Uh, but uh, uh, it's going to be upstream at some point. Uh, and uh, one of the features that we also added here is a very simple um, uh, device, PCIe device, some simulated PCIe device that we call memory mock because in the end it, it is a simple memory-like device. So basically, it is detectable over PCIe. You can connect over uh, wall pipe uh, with wall pipe to it and simply dump a memory, write a memory, and you know do the tra and observe the transactions uh, in, in, uh, between host and, and uh, yeah. the device. Of course, we're basically just talking about bars, memory bars, and the PCI terminology. And, and of course, we support memory bars, and then, as we mentioned already, MSIX and MSIS. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, so this is potentially uh, my my favorite subject because um, in reality you're not always just testing Kimu to Kimu or uh, you know Renode to Kimu or whatever. Um, often on the host side, and I'm not going to stay left or right because it's going to be backwards. But um, often on the host side, you don't want to run a whole Kimu thing. You want to run like your gtest test suite, or you want to run uh, something like that, like an application that's just talking directly to a socket, because we don't need to add additional complexity there. Uh, on the device side, you might not always be talking to Kimu. You might be hooked up to a gigantic hardware emulation system, because at some point you do want to test that this actually works. That could be your nightly runs, whatever. Um, so the beauty of Warpipe being purely socket-based is that you can add an adapter on 
on the device side, and that could be your translator to go from warp pipe socket protocol over to uh, hardware emulation. And various vendors, I'm not gonna name names, but various vendors have their own proprietary technology uh, to do the exact same thing. So this adapter is basically just converting from the open source format to the proprietary format that you're not allowed to publish anywhere. So it actually enables a lot of people behind closed doors, which is, at Meta, this was quite important for us. Um, uh, I don't know if there's anything else I need to cover, but again, like both sides of warp pipe are swappable for virtually any endpoint that you want to put in there. Yep. Um, one of the quite important aspects uh, of the development of the, of the whole uh, library uh, was actually performance of the library. Because you know, if we go back to the, one of the first slides, uh, I've been talking about, uh, you know, we can always default to RTO simulation, which is slow. Uh, the whole idea of like getting, uh, moving that to, to ISS is to basically live with, with a complex simulation, but still be in the uh, sweet spot of every computer scientist. Uh, like uh, I run the test and I have the answer immediately. Um, so uh, having performance is, was, was really, really, uh, really important. So there is a, a bunch of uh, performance tests uh, that are already uh, derived with, with the uh, with the library. Uh, so, and we do run them regularly to actually figure out all the bottlenecks, like uh, you know, not uh, uh, especially you know, with, with the, in the places where you do packetization and depacketization, uh, you can do it too much. Like you can split like a huge chunk of data into very very. Uh, small packets and then send them one by one, and that's super slow. Yeah. It's still probably faster than RTL, but it's not as fast as it can be. Um, so there is a lot of uh, work on that, uh, like on getting that performant and, and actually analyze the, the bottlenecks and then fix them uh, as it comes. So as I recall, there was one performance bottleneck, which is ironically uh, doing software calculation with CRCs, which is something that usually falls to hardware. So I think this is probably one feature where we could potentially disable it on the warp pipe layer because that's not, like the upper layers are not going to care about that uh, after depacketization. But uh, I, it, it's pretty fast. I, do we have a coverage slide or are we? Uh, not sure okay. if I, uh, well, yeah. Just, uh, so uh, I just wanted to highlight this tool, uh, just to refresh my memory, is this Perfetto that you guys were using? Uh, I don't remember the top of my head right now. Perfetto? I think yeah. it was Perfetto, which is the open source. Um, it's multi-analysis thing. It was actually open sourced by Google, which is really cool. So the, I'll be using that on a few projects for sure. The one there, I think, is Speedscope, though. Oh, sorry. But there's, but, there's just two options, Perfetto and Speedscope. That. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, talking about coverage, uh, if you go to the, the, to the repository, you can run uh, coverage tests by yourself. Uh, there is even a coverage report uh, there in the, in the documentation, but uh, the scripts for running that are there in the repository, so you can, you can run it. And of course, just a note on coverage. Um, as anyone is familiar with who's working in this area, there are always corner cases where it's virtually impossible to, uh, to get through with, with just hardware. So in some cases, you should be able to inject errors, that sort of thing, to get that, but um, coverage is actually pretty good. I think it was like 80, Five yeah, or something or like greater that, than yeah. that, so it's quite good. Yep. Uh, so uh, it's not all. There is still some work to be done, and, and uh, some work is uh, some some new features will uh, pop up uh, in the in the library itself. Uh, so first of all, one of the things that were impossible before right now are enabled is actually modeling of the uh, routing or arbitration uh, algorithm within like a PCI switches uh, in the simulation of, uh, of a bigger system. Uh, so right now this is doable. Of course, those models will have to be written, will have to be, the, the algorithms that are used there will have to be implemented or uh, reused from, from whatever uh, is already there. Uh, so this is something that, that right now is possible, uh, and, but of course have to be done. Uh, the other thing is like a hardware control, like uh, what if I reset my device? Uh, I need to have, a, first of all, this functionality of resetting the device and resetting the simulation on the other side and re-enumeration that in the simulation and stuff like that. Uh, but that's actually a pretty useful feature because it could happen uh, in, in, uh, in a real life scenario. You may want to reset 
uh, your device, especially, for example, in data centers. If you, if you uh, figure out that there is a hard fault on your device, uh, and, and some of the uh, PCIe faults requires you to reset the, uh, the, the PCIe device. You cannot really recover from that. You have to start from scratch. But you don't have to reboot the whole system. You can reset only a, a part of that. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, in the end, uh, a better way of, of designing like uh, very complex systems. And for that, we actually work on, uh, this is project that covers way more than just designing uh, uh, complex PCIe networks, uh, but it can be used for, for that. So a visual uh, system designer where we can simply uh, connect blocks of, uh, uh, it's not, not just, uh, you know, graph uh, drawing it's it's uh, uh, introspection and yes debugging and checking the console generating the simulation code generating the platform description from it directly uh, i know michael sitting there will be uh, presenting uh, today later in this in this room uh, a broader concept of, of uh, visualizing everything uh, but th this also happens there so imagine you can uh, simply connect those blocks generate the simulation code run the simulation code directly from it or even do things like uh, connect observers to certain lines and uh, do this packet dumps and wireshark observation from a certain lines on this on this graph uh, that's super cool i mean super useful and uh, way easier for uh, developer that uh, to, to understand what's happening. I mean, we know the code is better and we, the, the whole tools are designed in a way that they do based on a, on a coding first, but they can visualize the data and, and update the code on the fly. What's the next question? Okay. Uh, the next one is actually summary. So this is summing up. Uh, uh, Warpipe library in Office is one uh, uh, that you can just grab from, from the internet, permissively licensed. Uh, this is something that uh, enables complex PCIe system uh, testing in a way that will actually uh, mimic the, the underlying hardware structure. So this is uh, one step forward uh, from, from what we have right now uh, to stay in the uh, like very, very fast uh, simulation domain, but still be able to actually, you know, uh, simulate better what, what's happening uh, underneath. The one thing I forgot to mention, so I mean, right now we're talking about pre-silicon. I'm going to go back a few slides right here. So we've been talking so far about pre-silicon. What happens after post-silicon? You're still developing firmware, and you're still developing your host side stuff, either a Linux kernel driver, user mode driver, whatever it is. What's amazing about this topology is that you can actually containerize your host environment and use libvirt underneath. So if you have an adapter layer from Warpipe to libvirt, you're then actually talking to real silicon that you've gotten back from the fabric fabricator. So yep. it's, it's, it's useful because, I mean, we want to do fast continuous integration. So from that perspective, it's useful even after a post-silicon. That is true. Uh, so to get back to, to the last slide, uh, please go to GitHub, grab it, run it, test it, uh, report bugs. Uh, if you're interested in like uh, some talking around it, uh, some support for that, just you can hit us uh, uh, with this email or just grab like catch us uh, here at the conference. So we still have. And as well, if this is a space you're interested in working in, uh, where you're doing hardware accelerators over PCI Express. Uh, I, I'm new to TensTorrent, but I feel like I've been there forever now because it's been amazing. Uh, so we're hiring. So we've got stickers. Come by, talk to me, and thank you. Thanks. Uh, All right, so we do have some time for questions. Yeah, we'll I think like minutes, five ish, yeah. six ish minutes. We can always, you know, Dan, catch. I can see you're thinking about something. Yeah. Do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to wrap your brain around it. How can this make my life easier? It sounds like it can make my life easier. It can. <laughs> Anyone in the hardware space? Alexei?
Okay, so since I have a microphone, uh, yeah, so in Synopsis we obviously do something similar, but we are mostly interested in more interface-ish part of the thing, but not about data transfer, because, mm. well, that's, that's what some other team is doing. But in that sense, uh, so okay, so it works with Kimu, it works with VNode, uh, so what about uh, something else? So for example, uh, for me it would be interesting to integrate that with uh, some more proprietary things like virtualizer, which we have, for example, or with VCS, which is RTL simulation. Absolutely. So if I may sell it, that, that kind of tool, which is very amazing. So why not? Well, that's the beauty of a Warpipe, is it's a very permissive license. So uh, I, we, we haven't made any kind of standard for the packet format, but they are standard PCI uh, structures. So, um, and of course, you're free to use the library on any pro project you want. If you want to provide an adapter to this open source interface to your customers, that's fully uh, supported. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, I suppose we can catch up somewhere in the in the hall, unless you know, yeah, holy track. We'll get a coffee or whatnot. Thanks again for attending. Thanks, everyone. Ron. Yeah, time Thanks. for a break.